Good afternoon, viewers, and welcome to Futsal 868 Corner Talks. My name is Geoffrey Edwards, series moderator and president of the Futsal Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Futsal 868 Corner Talks is an online meetup series where global sporting professionals share their experiences and perspectives on the fastest growing indoor sport in the world, futsal. In recent sessions, we expanded to discuss topics of social issues and their relation to sport. Our main objective is to sensitize and educate sports stakeholders on the, on the game of futsal and other pressing local and global issues. Last October the 5th of, last Monday the 5th of October, the National Budget Statement 2021, entitled Resetting the Economy for Growth and Innovation, was presented by the Honorable Colum Inbert, Minister of Finance in the House of Representatives. In the 142-page document on the fiscal and other measures, item 19 out of 20 items was entitled Creative and Supporting Activities with one paragraph of information read by the Honorable Minister. Today, in episode 26, we talk sport and the budget. Our panel includes TNT's royalty of sport and industry leaders who will help review the presentation of the 2021 statement by answering the what, why, and how as we operate during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, joining us via our virtual studio is Ms. Son Mrs. Sonja Johnson, the president of the Trinidad and Tobago Chess Association, noting that the Trinidad and Tobago Chess Association is the proud recipient of the 2019 Jeffrey Stolmeyer Award from the First Citizens Bank in terms of sports organization of the year, large category. Followed, Mr. Brian Lewis, President of the Trinidad Tobago Olympic Committee. Mr. Kirvin Ja, who is the head of sports studies at the Open Campus for the University of the West Indies. And last but not least, Mr. Kenwin Jones, former captain of the Trinidad Tobago national football team, also known as the Soka Warriors. Lady and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank it you. is an utmost Thank pleasure to have each of you as team individuals spend Sunday evening with us on Futsal 860 Corner Talks. Before we start, I would like you all to please listen to this interview done on Power 102, mere hours before the release of the National Budget Statement. Sport has always received one of the smallest portions of the national budget and this year will be no different. This is the belief of President of the Futsal Association of Trinidad and Tobago, Jeffrey Edwards. Mr. Edwards told News Power Now that given the economic situation facing the country, he cannot realistically see last year's spend being increased. We saw that in 2019 to 2020, the budget allocation for the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs was um, just about $292 million, which represents 0. 51% of the national budget. Of that, 72% was recurrent expenditure with 23% being infrastructural development of funds. I expect that that allocation will be reduced again um, because we have been seeing a trend that the allocation to the Ministry of Sport and Community Development before Ministry of Sport and Affairs have been decreasing. So we expect that that trend will continue. Edwards, who is also a sport tourism promoter, told our newsroom that regardless of the government spend, the owner should be on our sporting bodies to become sustainable rather than repeatedly relying on the government to fund their operations. He admitted that more can be done by the government to encourage collaboration between the private sector and the sporting industry. However, Edwards, who is also the UE Sport Program Coordinator for the Swiss-based Center for Sports Studies, noted that good governance is important and must be established throughout the industry if that bridge is to be developed. My humble suggestion would be to encourage NSOs and NGBs to create strategic plans, to create governance policies. And with governance policies, it speaks to proper procedures, checks and balances, but most importantly, having competent people. Sport is a business. 
and we need to put our house in order to be able to act like a business. What I can say is that I would like that the government of the Republic of Sri and Tobago to add value by encouraging companies to partner with NSOs, NGBs, community-based sporting organizations to be able to promote sport at all levels. Whereby corporate TNT given the incentive from the government to them for their involvement in sport. So, with that being my contribution and my opening remarks, I would like to hear from each one of your your opening remarks as regards to your expectations of the budget days before, hours before, moments before the Honorable Minister Colin Inbert would have presented to the nation, looking at it from our lens, sports stakeholders. I will start with you, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, for me, when I look at, at the budget and so on, um, I go a little bit, I view things a little bit differently. I look at the underlying, I say the underlying, what is the vision that we have what do we, what's the vision that we have for our country? What's the vision that we have for our citizens, for our societies? And then based on that, the priorities should be set. Yeah, um, in looking at the, the, the major spends in the budget, of course, they have the priorities going towards health, education, um, agriculture. Um, there's some near the end in terms of housing, which again, addresses some of the basic needs um, of it. And then there's national security somewhere inside of there. That's a different um, discussion. But as it relates generally to sport, based on what I'm seeing, sports still um, got less than 1% of, of the budget. And again, um, we don't have full details. I've gone through several documents. I don't have all the details, you know, looking at the line items and so on. So, so really the question is, what are the objectives? What do we want from this spend? Whatever that spend is, have we done an analysis on how we've spent money in the past? What were the returns that we got on it? Was it aligned to what we see for ourselves as, as a society and as a country? So I think that those are the kinds of questions I would think as in my opening remarks, and I'm hoping that we, if we did not ask, that we ask those in order to come up with what we need to do to move forward. So despite whatever the, the eventual allocation is, the specifics for development and so on, make sure we go and do the homework and understand um, what it is we've done in the past, what it is we're hoping to create. Because remember, you now have blended ministries with Ministry of Sport and Community Development. We're not looking at what the overlap was from community or from youth and vice versa. How does youth and national service, does it dovetail? So we don't even understand those dynamics. So let's, I, mean, I will just take a step back before proffering anything and let's ask those questions. Let's see in the context of everything, all that we've done all the changes, clearly we did the changes towards some end. Let's make sure that we would have done the homework in terms of what we didn't do um, especially if we want to move towards some particular objective and vision. Mr. Lewis, your turn, sir. Thank you very much. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me just say that. And, um, you know, I think that what you and your organization are doing, it's very innovative and creative, and it can be an example for all sport organizations, um, your entrepreneurial approach and uh, I think it, it's apt because if I have to point to a sport organization that is fit for purpose for the current environment, um, it will be futsal. And I'm happy to elaborate on that as we as we go on. Um, let, let me just say that the budget, I think because I'm, I'm, I'm involved, you know, most people forget so that, so that we, those of us involved in sport, it's a, Volunteer nonprofit. It's not paid. It's not so. So I'm involved in in small small business, the small business sector, and um, the, the the sector that I'm involved in, we have been totally devastated. Um, that's that's the hospitality center sector and the event management sector, and uh, no income coming in. 
And I say that to set this scene before before I, I step back and, and hear the others and enjoy what I hope to be a very exciting, informative discussion. COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought uh, devastation, um, and that's no overstatement. It, it has brought all sectors, economies to, to stand still. And the reality is, Trinidad and Tobago is no exception. We are in survival mode at this point in time. And that is the context for the budget. Um, and uh, I look forward to further elaboration as, as we go forward. I will move on to Mr. Jacques, your opening remarks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Uh, with regards to expectations for the budget, um, I think you and I are on the same page, understanding that sport has historically received one of the smallest budgets and one of the first budgets to get cut if any detrimental shocks come to the economy is sport. So it was looking forward you understand that, okay, this is, has been happening historically and I expected with this budget for the trend to continue. I did expect a lower allocation than last year. And we saw that in that you would have quoted 392 million, now they're down to 301 million. Um, one of the things that is peculiar, and Sonia would have alluded to that, is that when you look at the allocations, it still says uh, Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs, understanding that that is a ministry that no longer exists. And we have Ministry of Sport and Community Development. Also, the youth ministry is a different ministry. So it's going to be interesting to see when we get down to the nitty gritty how um, the allocations will be will be further subdivided amongst all of those stakeholder ministries. Additionally, um, one of the things I wanted to add with regards to moving forward and the stakeholders, um, I think um, several forums I would have mentioned it that this is something we would have expected. And there is some saving grace in everything that's going on, whether we have a reduced budget or not in that we have to clean house as port administrators, as national governing bodies. This is a time for us to one, align our operations to a national mandate in terms of the uh, aligning to the national policy on sport. Additionally, we need to look at what the Ministry of Sport is gonna be putting out for this fiscal year and align our operations in order to maximize funding. Additionally, well, subsequent to that, Following off of what you said, I think the time has come for a lot of us national governing bodies to kind of cut the umbilical cord, understanding that yes, sport is a business, but in order for us to truly say sport is a business and build on the sport industry in Trinidad and Tobago, we then have to move away from government funding and start diversifying our operations so that we can start generating revenues, if not to sustain ourselves at least, but to cover the operational costs of the administrations of the NGBs. Understanding that that has a lot of NGBs in a rut when it comes to seeking funding for developmental programs and even elite uh, high performance programs. So um, it was interesting in terms of the budget. I have a lot more to say on it, but I'm with when we get into the bulk of the discussions. Thank you. Over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Mr. Jacques. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Ja. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Um, pleasant good afternoon to everyone on the panel, um, to the viewers on looking. Unfortunately for me, I would I, I would I wouldn't have much to say again because I think um, the panelists so far have covered everything. Um, for far too long, we've been saying that our sporting administrations or organizations need to be more efficient acting as, 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 as a business of sport. And in this pandemic, in this current pandemic in the world, I think um, more so we have to, 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 to be a bit on the front foot where, um, where in this regard. I think um, if we, as organizations, as, as uh, in the country, um, waited until the budget to be able to, to start putting our minds together or collective efforts together, um, in terms of strategic planning on how we are going to move forward, I think we are definitely a few steps behind the curve at this present time. So um, looking forward to the budget and, and, and what is going to be released for sports, we cannot depend on, on, on a massive spend. Um, rightly so, Mr. Jean, you said um, we have to collaborate with the government in terms of the elite funding and developmental programs. But I think more so for the organizations, we have to start to plan how are we going to move away 
from that and how are we going to develop our organization to become more self-sufficient? It's really great to hear, as I said, I call your sport leaders and the royalty of sport in Trinidad and Tobago. Give your opening remarks. The budget speaks to, in my opinion, and the opinion of Futsal 868, three major stakeholders, the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the NGBs, NSOs, as well as corporate TNT. We are not at this juncture forgetting the athletes. But with that being said, my question to you all and in assisting us to educate the persons who are looking on. And the reason we wanted to do this is because we have seen, given the political landscape of our young nation, that culturally we have become a people that only seek to receive and not to give or to give little. How, what do you all see as the role of these three stakeholders, the government, NGBs and NSOs, and last but not least, the corporate Trinidad and Tobago? I leave it to you all as panel to open discussion. Let, let me let me just jump in here quickly because I want I want I would like I think it is Dr. Jean eh, to be very correct. Not yet, not, not yet. yet. Give me some time. So, I'll get so, to so you. he's along that path, right? Making this a real study. But what I just wanted to frame it with is that when we talk about the budget and, and the allocation for sport, I don't know if we recognize. So I know that people on, on, on here would have done it. But for example, if you look at the draft estimates of the recurrent expenditure, there are a number of line items, but the most important line item there is non-profit institution, which is really related to the sport organization. And that figure is about $11 million. It is 33 million for salaries, goods and services. And there's a line item for sport company there of 99 million. Now sport company will have facilities, which they, they, they spend a lot on. They have salaries. And then they have about 14 to 15 um, sports under them. So I always try to point out to people that when we talk about the allocation for sport, we must recognize there is an allocation for the Ministry of Sport and now Community Development and sport company. But the allocation for national sporting organization in the draft estimates, is $11 million. That's for about 40 something, 15 something. What organization that also, also coming out of there has to be, will be the elite athlete assistant funding and any other funding. For example, if the TTUC is being supported for the team to go to the Olympics, that comes out from there. And I think that's an important distinction that I wanted to, to throw into the part on this. Mr. Lewis, thank you very much for that input. To any of our panelists, and you could choose one of these stakeholders or all three, please do share with us what is their role as regards to sport in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Geoffrey, I, I just will take a stab at it. Um, I think I want to look at, well, given the context, of course, that, that Brian has raised, which is very, very clear, um, in terms of what the allocation is for sporting bodies. So that is already a, a challenging challenging position. But I, I want to take go back to some of the remarks that you made, Kenwin made and so on, in terms of the role of NSOs. And I want to touch a little bit in terms of the roles of corporate, right? So we see that um, in terms of the roles of NSOs, I think NSOs, and especially given this time, um, as was said before, if we weren't already contemplating what we needed to do prior to this budget, we were a little bit late. How, how COVID would have transformed what we need to do, not just for now, but in the future. Um, we might have to change totally our model of, of operations. I don't know how many people are looking at that um, to try and make go towards self-sustainability. Yeah, of course, the government, I still has, think, has quite a bit of roles to play because not all 
NSOs are created equal, people at different levels of development. So we need to understand that to see how, what would be the best way to support this. But I want to talk a little bit in terms of governance and packaging and so on, because as NSOs, we are responsible for our product, right? The product that we offer as, a, as an NSO. Because even if we want anyone, any other stakeholder, either to partner with us, even if it's not financial, or a partner who's a financial partner, it's all going to depend on the product that, that we offer. But it's not just that, it's how is that product aligned to that particular partner or stakeholder's objectives. So we have to, to really do our homework on some of that. But on the flip side, um, in terms of stakeholders, I think that sometimes, because one of the concerns that I'm seeing or being raised, I mean, of course, I have to get more information is that, for example, you're, you're offering stakeholders or other potential partners an allowance, right? That could be written off and, and so on. But yet it doesn't seem like there's full uptake. Why is there not full uptake? So we need to understand, ask ourselves those questions. Could what would what would it take for a stakeholder to, to have a multi-year partnership with, with someone? Of course, a, a handful of football, a, a handful of organizations do get that, but it's really in the minority. So you, what you want is getting that kind of partnership that will help. For, for NSOs to understand what is required to help even in some of the capacity building, what it is to help reframe your whole business model. Maybe those are some of the, 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 the non-tangible, the intangible type things that could be done um, in terms of partnerships with, with private sector who have been there and done that and have successful business models to work with maybe some of the developing or even some of the developed sporting organizations. So maybe it's something to consider. I don't know to what extent it's done, but I think that now we really have to look at how best we could make use of all the resources we have available, um, uh, whether it's government, since we know government will have a diminished role, and let's see how else we could move forward with other parties. Mr. Jean, yeah, thank you. I wanted to add to that. See, in any state, uh, the government sets policy. And in, all, in the smallest terms, policy is basically what governments do or choose not to do. Understanding that the government would have invested in a national policy on sport, consulting with the, regular, the relevant stakeholders. In development of that policy, what you have is an overarching mandate for Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to the governmental direction for sport, as well as the stakeholders, what they require. That being said, the government is not directly responsible for the implementation of that policy. Understand, policy, there are some policy directives that will fall within the remit of the government, such as provision of infrastructure and all of the other such items. But predominantly, policy implementation is at the level of national governing bodies, sports serving bodies, and community organizations. What government will do, provide funding for those aspects uh, for the achievement of policy objectives. So your developmental programs, your total participation programs, even high performance programs. But the onus is on the national governing bodies to implement the policy assisted by government funding. So the government basically just sets the overall tone and provides support through funding for the achievement of the policy objectives. That's the first instance. Um, national governing bodies is NKD are responsible for the implementation of policy with assistance from government. Additionally, the national governing bodies are responsible for mobilizing the relevant stakeholders, expanding their participation base, and in those areas where there are national programs, ensuring that there is development and, well, for those who participate in international comp competitions, international competitions as well. Corporate Trinidad is basically there to support. And corporate Trinidad, if you look at, say, for instance, more, some of the more capitalistic nations, you realize that sport development is driven more so by corporate as opposed to government intervention. Um, we have not had success because a lot of the times there is no structure to how we approach it. More so, um, we would have taken a slip uh, two to three years back where the, the advent of the sustainable development goals. A lot of these corporate sponsors who would have been aligned to sporting organizations would have stepped away, they would have had a policy directive change and they would have started looking at more sustainable development matters as opposed to sporting collaborations. So a lot of sporting organizations, NSOs, NGPs would have lost valuable sponsorship. I think we're in a current time now, as it stands, as 
we need to understand the importance of sport at this point in time. And I think the world would have realized how important sport was, most as it relates to the mental awareness and mental well-being. Because a lot of people are on the stream. You have to understand that. And we saw the results of that, so much so that we now have a number of sports rejuvenated and ongoing right now. That has somewhat given us uh, some leeway of operations, a bit of freedom. We don't, it isn't opened up as much. So I think now that we understand where we are, I think NGBs now, like I think Mr. Lewis would have indicated, Sonia would have indicated, Ken would have indicated, and you yourself, we now need to take advantage of this situation, go back to the drawing board, put up proper structures, understanding the important role that we are playing to try to incentivize corporate Trinidad and Tobago to partner with us. And I think that is the, the major roles right now. And moving forward, I think there has to be a little more synergy across those three stakeholder bodies that you mentioned. One, in terms of providing oversight, and that would be the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs and its executory company, the Sport Company of Trinidad and Tobago. The NGBs, and I've always said it for a number of times, we need to have an association of national sporting organizations because what we have is a number of dissected organizations with no one voice, and we're competing with each other in most instances. I think it's time that we come together. Now is the perfect time for that. So there, when national governing bodies speak, they're speaking through one organization with one voice. That way, corporate Trinidad could then be somewhat welcoming in terms of partnering with that organization, understanding that one, good governance is a key part of that advancement, and we need to look at that. Mr. Jones. Well, to be honest, it's, to be honest it's, it's, it's what I've been saying for quite a number of years. I think, um, you know, uh, 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 kudos to, to the NGB of, of, or the NSO of, of the TTCB and now Futsal 868, um, the TTOC, um, for having, I think, so far, in my purview, uh, um, good governance, good structure to the organization. I think the rest of the organizations are lacking that for whatever reasons. Um, saying that, that is the main reason, as Mr. John said before and Ms. Johnson before that, that is the main reason I think most sporting organizations have lost funding. And, and we know this, we've had this in society, um, the repeated refrain of accountability, transparency, um, of course, structure now we're, as we're bringing up in this conversation. Um, we've not had for most of the organizations. So, so therefore, you're not going to get the government stretching their hand beyond the um, policies that they have or corporate Trinidad stretching their hands beyond um, the, the, the major sports or, or the sporting organizations that have that good structure, good practices, accountability, and so on. Um, another major factor for us, I, I think, apart from the allocation in the budget, for Trinidad and Tobago especially, I think we have a problem in operation, in sport operation, where how do we go about funding the, 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 the testing of, 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 of COVID-19 for all our stakeholders um, as we go out to sport? There is no outline for us as, as how we're going to open up those realms again for sport. Um, that in itself comes with a serious undertaking of um, financial resources. And if we're speaking about um, the, in, in the budget, the allocation for sport just being $11 million, how is that going to be stretched across all the different disciplines of sport? That is what we need to ask ourselves. How are we going to go forward in, in re-ingraining ourselves in sport again, because our organizations, as we can tell, we depend on government funding. We see what the allocation is, but how is how how our organizations are going to fund even taking care of the stakeholders, which are the the the, the athletes, um, whether they they be the elite or the amateurs? How are we going to be able to go into communities to 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 expand and develop? How are we going to do that? That's one of the biggest questions we have to ask ourselves. So it clearly shows that out of all these stakeholders, the onus is not only government or corporate. Jeffy disappeared there. 
technical difficulties. <laughs> well, yeah. let, let me just add, add to it because we, we have to keep the show rolling, right? Yes. Um, you yeah. want to say I, I, I take a, a slightly different position too. Um, you're on live? You're back on live? Right? I, I am back on live with my, um, just, it, it's getting a little hot inside here. So even right. everything getting by functional, so I don't, right. I don't dose it down with a little bottle of, you know, 860 holy so, so, water. So you're trying to keep the show going. Um, it's a very interesting. And I appreciate, I I appreciate I that. A, a quick point here, right? Not, not quick, but um, so when you were saying that the NGBs are part of the policy um, implementation, I, I'm not sure I would agree with that. Let me say why, right? For sure, if you look at other sectors in the in the in the, in the, in the government and the economy. Implementation of policy is the ministries and their special purpose or state enterprises. So, so in the case of sport, it can be argued that that is the Ministry of Sport and Community Development now and the sport company. And, and why I say that from, a, from an analysis of the budget, we keep saying for years that you know sport is under resourced. But the reality is that we currently have now about $4 billion worth of physical assets. And every year you have between 67 million, and, and I, just, I just said, if you look at the budget, $150 million that goes to the Ministry of Sport and the Community Development now and sport company. And what you are saying is that part of a, of a policy Structure the volunteer sport organizations are responsible for driving the implementation and the execution of the policy. I think that if that is how we are envisaging the how it will work, I think that may be one of the fundamental issues we need to be to resolve because between the NPI vote or the nonprofit institution vote of 11 million and whatever sport company is giving to the 14 sport organization, then it will never happen because the NSOs are under-resourced, all right? Because the bulk of the fund, and let's put it on the table as part of this analysis, the Thank bulk you. of the resources goes to the staffing, salaries, goods and services. Yes, at the Ministry of Sport and Community Development now, and at the sport company. And that is not said in any negative way, but as part of an analysis, okay? The other thing in terms of corporate trying and debate, it is unrealistic at this point in time to even consider corporate trying and to be able to get involved to bail out sport because they're fighting for survival, which I just saw something came across my timeline where movie tongue, is closing down movie tongue ship bonus, right? So what I'm saying is that for the next fiscal year, corporate trend and Tobago will be in their own battle. And we can talk about it later. That's why when someone asked about the allowance, there are not many corporate people in Trinidad and Tobago that can afford that level of allowance or that can at this time convince their shareholders and board to invest that in sport. So I'm saying that I'm just putting that out there. Um, not to take over from Mr. Edwards, who, who you know, I know, I, I, it's just that I think that's an important analysis because this, the NGBs and NSO that in the framework of the policy and what I've been outlined that is, 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 is they are supposed to do, then it's an impossible task because it is all. The majority, all, uh, all the funding goes to the national, the, the, the Ministry of Sport and um, the, the sport company. All right. Just allow me to clarify one thing, Mr. Edwards, before. Um, when I say that the ultimately policy implementations lie, or implementation lies with the NSOs and NGBs, you need to understand one. Um, Policy is not implemented by the government. Policy objectives are transacted through the national governing bodies, through government funding. So 
if it were if policy were implemented by government um what you would have found is the same situation that would have been happening about two three years ago where the ministry itself would have been having community programs school programs and everything of the sort um why i say that it is implemented through the ngbs government gives funding to the ngbs to operate for their operations so ngbs through their clubs and associate members would then have those developmental programs and other such programs that support the policy objectives. So in essence, the government is not on the ground per se implementing. The policy objectives are initiated or transacted through the operations of the national governing bodies, clubs, clubs, um, community organizations, and sports serving bodies. So it's not like uh, looking at it from a layman perspective saying that, hey, you are responsible for it. Inadvertently, operations of NGB support the objectives, the attainment of policy objectives. It is just transacted through them and it is supported by the government. Now, ideally, what you, you did indicate that they are underfunded and rightly so, because if you look at what NGBs get compared to what they're trying to do and what they're supposed to be doing, it is little to nothing, so much so that the first thing that suffers as a result of that is the national the developmental programs. Most of the monies that they get are directed towards their high performance programs at the expense of the developmental programs and the grassroots programs. So and I do understand that. And yes, it is an issue that has to be looked at. And I think right now is an opportune time for NGBs because like you rightly said, Mr. Mr. Lewis, um, corporate training that is suffering right now. So NGBs now have to pull their resources together. And I always say you need to collaborate because now you don't have anybody to turn to. There is limited funding available on the international stage but you have to understand these are extenuating time, circumstances and times that we're living in. The world is affected. So funding at this juncture is gonna be it's gonna be little to nothing. So we now have to look at how we're gonna continue with our operations in this new environment. And it may call for us to start thinking outside of the box. Very so, interesting. Point of view. I will, I, I, I will allow you to take over one. Well, it's important for me to clarify this. It is absolutely <laughs> important because it is fundamental to the conversation. And I don't want to be argumentative with my very good friend. <laughs> if NGBs and NSOs fill that role in terms of the policy directive, then we won't have the issue between TTFA and FIFA. We won't have the issue between NSOs and the International Federation because at the end of the day, and, and, and Kevin will attest to this and, and somewhere. The NSOs are ultimately responsible for delivering the objectives and the policy of the International Federation. I'm just saying that to, 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 to clarify and why it's not, it's not an argument, but it may very well be the reason for a lot of the, the dysfunction came. Can win in in, in in the conversation because the rules and responsibilities. So there is an expectation from the policy directive side. But for example, the TTOC, at the end of the day, as much as we will support the national sports policy, that support can't come at the expense and at the failures of our accountability and responsibility to the International Olympic Committee. Well, so Lewis, if I may jump in there, if I may jump in there, because this, this opens up, this opens up as always, as always, crisis brings opportunities, but conversations like this also brings opportunities. And for us at Futsal 868, I'm also seeing corner talks having a discussion on governance, sports governance and policy. So I definitely would like us to have a discussion on that further. But for the sake of time, because I know that some people might have to go and eat ice cream and spend family time, I just would like us to oh, just, just, quickly, just quickly move on as we may be, as we may, right? Um, in terms of corporate trying to be we want to say special thanks to, to Rizzoni's for, be, for sponsoring this, this segment. We can't show the ad because this is a heated topic, but we definitely can mention our foot down 868, you know, it's a little hot inside here. <laughs> I think I said we'll be right back. You're watching Futsal 868 Corner Talks. I'm your host, Geoff Edwards, and this is our team guest. This come back. We're coming back. We're coming back. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank you.
yes, follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and subscribe to this page to get the best of Scuba Sport Leaders as we meet every Sunday on our corner, Fatal 86 Corner. But before the break, the short break, we were speaking as regards to stakeholders. Now we go into the, 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 the meat of the matter, so to speak. So let's take a quick look at the statement read by the Honorable Minister of Sport, of Minister of Finance to his 2021 national statement. And it reads, Madam Speaker, I propose to increase, and, and I could read this because I'm a scenes man, you know, Zimbumba, so I could speak, I, would, I can't speak his voice, but I could try and read it. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I propose to increase to 12 million the current tax allowance of 6 million for corporate sponsorship of nationals in the local fashion industry, audio, visual, or video productions for the purpose of local education, for the purpose of local education or entertainment and local production companies in respect of their own productions, as well as the companies which sponsor sporting activities or events or sportsmen or art and culture. This measure will take effect from January 1st, 2021. At this juncture, I asked a couple of my affiliates, associates, family and friends to send in questions. And one was very interesting that popped out to me. And it goes as this, how has the tax break for business Sponsor, sponsoring sporting activities and athletes been working because it moved from 6 to 12. Has it been making a difference so far for NGBs? And Sanjal asks you that question. Do you anticipate that the proposed increase will encourage businesses to invest in sports? And this question is a perfect link to what how we ended the first segment. So I will read it again while you all formulated thoughts and I would like any one of you all, please, I will actually start with Sanjay and the rest can yes. follow in to please chime in thereafter. So the question reads as follows. How has the tax break for business sponsoring sporting activities and athletes been working? Has it been making a difference so far for the NGBs? And do you anticipate that the proposed increases will encourage businesses to invest in to invest in sport? Such a mouthful, once again, add a tint in the bottle and take us. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks so much for the question. Well, I, when I was speaking before, you know, I alluded specifically to the tax allowance, and and I know that everybody's saying, okay, this is so great and so on, but there are questions to be asked. Now, if I speak to as an NSO and if I speak to my fellow NSO colleagues, we have not really seen that kind of benefit be meted out to us. Now, I know there are many other factors that you may have to consider. So therefore, that's why I, I suggested that maybe we needed to understand why there was not that kind of that level of of uptake that may have been expected, even as the six million, because six million is still a lot for a company, um, an organization to invest in, in anything that is not its core business. So until we understand what that is, I think we were kind of be spinning a top in mud, you know, if, if you know what I mean. Um, so at this point, whether it's six, it's 10, it's 12, unless you understand what are the underlying factors that drive success for such a program, and based on what I'm seeing, that has not been the case, um, then I, I don't foresee um, any major benefit. And especially what Brian was saying, I think it's very, very salient in that businesses are just trying to survive. Many, many businesses have been hurt um, uh, through their production, through their business, exports, everything. So to even expect that they will have that kind of expenditure outlay through sport or art or whatever it is, is really not as realistic. So I know the, the government may be looking for some non-cash type um, uh, items and so on to help in terms of making sure you have incentives that don't actually um, involve an outlay of cash. But I really don't foresee that this is going to be as impactful as it may be, um, as it's being promoted. 
before, we, before I before I put on to, to you, Mr. Shah, I just want our 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 audience to take a quick look at this diagram that shows the summary of recurrent expenditure estimates between 2013 and 2019. Again, another great link to what Mrs. Johnson has been was speaking about and what Mr. Lewis was speaking about, for which I definitely would like Mr. Jar's input to my initial question. But if we if it is we pay attention to it, we notice that first and foremost there has been a downward decline to some extent um, in terms of a trend. And what is the majority of the budget spent on? Correct. Very important for us to note before it is we continue conversation. Mr. Jar, right. yours, sir. Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, the first thing I want to mention before I delve into the matter would have been this in that paragraph and the statement was where exactly spot was mentioned. So if similarly, if you're looking at a new product on a shelf and you look at the ingredients, you know it starts with the one with the highest concentration to the one of the list. If you look at that that statement and see where exactly down spot is located, you understand that spot actually falls behind the fashion industry, audiovisual productions, and local education or entertainment and all of that sort. That's the first point I want to make. Subsequent to that, for there to have any traction in that $12 million, government has to input measures to make it or the to, to reduce the amount of bureaucracy to access that 12 million. During my tenure at the Ministry of Sport, um, it was not it was a million, I think, then. And many when the ministry had hosted, I think, bridge a bridge in the gaps seminar which was intent to bring the corporate Trinidad together to the, with the NGBs to have better collaborations. A number of the individuals would have indicated prior that there was too much bureaucracy or too much red tape to access the monies. And they were making recommendations that the ministry had to work with Ministry of Finance to make it a little bit easier for them to access such, such funding. I'm not sure if that was done, but in order for that 12 million to have any traction with corporate Trinidad and Tobago, they have to have fiscal measures implemented that makes it a lot easier for them to recoup those monies as opposed to having to go through about three or four years trying to get it back thank you very much for that mr ja anyone else would like to make comments based on that question mr lewis i would love to hear your 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 input yeah but i, I I'm, I'm happy to comment but i'd love to hear ken wins our input Oh, thank you for that, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, to be honest, as 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 Ms. Johnson or Mrs. Johnson, sorry, um, rightfully said, um, it's going to be difficult for businesses. Mr. Lewis um, alluded to this earlier. In this current situation, I think um, amidst all the the conversation that we're having at this present time, um, the pandemic is is real. It is here. And we are going to have to maneuver through that first before we do anything else. Um, in other countries, we have seen sport, again, back on the front page, whether the other stakeholders, the fans, are not there. Um, but the sport itself is being driven on. Um, here, specifically to Trinidad and Tobago, where we have just moved up from... Um, an association or intermingling of five people to ten people, with the, the 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 contraction of the virus still at a very high rate for us. Um, so how are we going to 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 be ingrained in sport again? Like I said before, the operational cost to protect the the participants, the stakeholders um, <clears throat> in sport is 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 a lot, and if Corporate Trinidad is, is, is struggling to, to make ends meet. Um, the government's um, allocation to sport is, is, is so little. How is sport going to function? I think, as Mr. John rightfully said, it is time for us to, to, to collaborate, to be synchronized, and to be able to, to think outside of the box so sport can 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 function from within first before we look on the international stage. And I'm sorry for the National Chess and Futsal Organization and, and the Olympic Committee when looking at our elite um, programs. But as for now, we need to, to figure out how are we going to do things locally before we get to that international stage. Yeah, so 
if I can come in now, I, I agree totally with, with Kenwin. Um, I think that's why I wanted to hear what he had to say. Um, but let, let me just say this. The, 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 the um, CPL, let me just say CPL. CPL sucks up a lot of funding from corporations that are in Tobago. There are a number of entities, whether they be football schools and cricket academies, community um, groups that get funding. So I think the important thing that one of the things I would like to see coming out of this, and I, I think Mr. Ja fits a very important role in that when they talk about collaboration, because it is what we are collaborating on. You see data, it's very difficult to make informed decisions, strategic decisions without data. And we have searched faith at the level of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee because we have a very strategic marketing plan where um, we, we have been successful in terms of on the corporate sponsorship side. But data, there's an absence of data. So how how what, what is it? What is the quantum of the of the sponsorship that is currently existing? Um, you know, how is it deployed? I think that is important in terms of, of a discussion. And that is something I would like to see maybe at the level of the University of the West Indies as part of the, the TTOC's uh, MOU with, with, with UTT. That type of information to be allowed to be, to be done so that all the sports stakeholders, we, we can make informed decisions. Because when you look at how Amcham operates, et cetera, and, and the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber, a lot of the time when they are talking about the budget or making budget submission, it is based on data, not what 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 people feel, but but hard numbers, hard data. Mr. Lewis, I want to say thank you very much for that. As regards the data. It is very important for us to understand what's happening. In 2020, according to the Public Sector Investment Program, the government invested the sum of $36.4 million. And this was to improve sport and recreation infrastructure, including but not limited to the upgrading of swim pools, recreational and corporate grounds and national stadium. The equivalent in 2021 is expected to be approximately 56.3 million, including 11.6 million that goes to the Ministry of Rural Development and local government for the upgrade of facilities in 14 municipal corporations. The 2021 budget estimate for the Ministry of Sport and Community Development is just over 404 million, which is an increase to its 2020 allocation of just over 392 million just some facts, but I wanted us to take some time to look at it, not just read it, but to look at it. Construction of community swimming pools, 4 million. Development of a master plan for sport and youth facilities, 0.5 million. Upgrade of multi-purpose stadia, 5 million. Noting that this upgrade of multi-purpose stadia include the Jean, Jean Pierre complex and the Hazy Crawford stadium. I'm a little bit complex at that figure. Development and upgrade of recreational grounds, parks and spaces, 2.5 million. Improvement of indoor sport and arenas, 12 million. Upgrade of co corporation grounds, 4 million. Upgrade of Mahika Oval, 10 million. My father would be very much pleased of that coming from that part of the region, but 10 million, ah, oof. Upgrade of Dwight York Stadium, phase three, 5 million. Upgrade of Skinner Park, a great icon in the Southland, great landmark, I should say, 15 million. And as I said before, based on the Ministry of Rural Development and local government, upgrade of recreational facilities, which is 14 of them, 11.6 million. There we have the data. From, from the little bit that I, I have read, I think that there's some disparity in there. Um, what are your thoughts to that breakdown 
And I'm going to start back. I'm going to go back. I'm going to start where we finished. The last person, Mr. Lewis. That is your great down there. Data right. is in front of your face. Right. So before we get into the fact is that here we watch strikes me about that, right? And I can tell you, pre-COVID, I'm probably, I don't think I have anyone other than Mr. Ja who would have traveled around this country. I sometimes just go Saturday family drive on a, on, a, on a weekend, on a Sunday. We'll go as far as Guaya Guaya. I could tell you where they have cows and goats eating grass on recreation grounds throughout this country where they have lights on at, in the night and a, and a dog exercising, right? So I say that to say this. And this is why I continue to say that we have to change the way we look at things and people, people get annoyed with me because they say, well, maybe I'm being pro something, right? But you have to work with what you have. And, and a simple question, why these facilities that we currently have there is no connect between these facilities and the program conducted by the various national sporting organizations, right? There's a lot of opportunities. Whether you go Moruga, I've been in Moruga, my family from Rio Caro, I've been in Rio Caro, empty. No, I'm saying we have an opportunity post COVID to look at, because I think. The, the economic transformation of, of the sports industry lies in that type of, of activity. And when we say, we do, you know, the sport industry, this and that, I, I keep bringing people back to this. And it's not a bugbear, so don't, nobody don't take offense from it. We have the, the ministry, salaries, when you look at salaries and goods and services within the sport industry, not just every level of the Ministry of Sport and Youth Affairs, but sports medicine doctors, massage therapists, sneakers, everybody wearing a smart sneaker, somebody selling it, gyms, etc. Um, there is a sport industry in China and Tobago. It may be concentrated in particular areas, right? The other thing I just want to wanna add is that I don't hold the view that the solution to developing an economic viable sport industry in Trinidad and Tobago lies with the sporting organization. The NSO's role and function is generally regulatory. What we need is sport entrepreneurs. We, we need vibrant thinkers like, like Kenwin who have come back from, from abroad and have ideas that could be implemented from an entrepreneurial perspective. That's what we need because the sport organization have not been able to connect to these community grounds throughout the country. Mr. Lewis, yes. I hear you well, and, and, and I, I hear pause, and I thank you for, for, for seeing a little cue of pausing. But does not that speak to governance when it comes to having competent persons within your organization? Noting that as we always we keep we have been, we have been hearing for years um, that many of the NSOs NGBs are run by moms and pops, which leads us into problems, whether it be on the local scene or the international scene. Is that not the same thing? It's not the same. Well, the role, the role of the NSO is the sanction, right? So CPL operates. Um, there are a number of activities that take place for sports related. You, you as an example, foot style. You, as far as I, I, I know, not a good chance, but you are actual member. The organization is a member of the TTFA. Notwithstanding what is happening within the TTFA, you are able to activate. What I'm saying is that, and Ken, I'm going to attest to this. You look at all the professional sports sectors abroad, they aren't run by NGBs and national sporting organizations, nowhere in the world that, that happened. They, they are regulatory. They, they administrate the rules and regulation, the national teams and where, like the FIFAs and the IOCs, they have a big world championship. They use that. But the sport industry, the, the, the transformation of the sport industry in Trinidad and Tobago, in my view, lies with the young, vibrant entrepreneurs like yourself and Ken Min, and others who are out there who are doing things that is separate and apart from the policy prescriptive 
that may, that may touch broader things such as, as wellness and, and participation. But participation may not make money for an NSO or, or an entrepreneur. And, and I'm saying in the de deconstruct of, of the conversation about the sport industry and the budget, we have to look at these things because there are facilities, there are $4 billion of assets on the ground. If it was private sector, Ken and, 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 and Sonia, somebody will be figuring out how to monetize mm -hmm. activities using these things. You know, but I know post COVID, we have to talk about that. But I, I genuinely believe because when you go up around this country, they are, the youths and young people in these communities are starving for activity. They tell me, but you know, along the NC, some, you know, I don't want to talk, but the reason I'm pausing is that you have a lot of people on, I mean, Ken Men and others, I want to hear them too. I'm here to hear them, you know. I, I, I was going to do that, Ms. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson. I want to add. Before before you go, Mr. Jar, because Miss Mrs. Johnson had a, a had a, a tense stare, but not only a tense stare, but she was she was I could hear her muttering and mumbling in the background. Talk to me, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> well, well, for me, um when I started my opening remarks, I, I recall saying that we need to understand what we've done in the past, how we've used whatever resources or allocations and so on that we in the past, how, what did it work? Was it efficient? Was it optimal? Before we then determine how it is we're going to move forward. So I'm looking at the spend for say the community. So that is what I was really looking at. I'm like, it's interesting. I don't know how these, these allocations are done. Some of them don't seem realistic, but really have we done an assessment from what I understood is that we have a very high per capita in terms of community grounds and so on in this country already. So, so it's a couple of things. Have we done the analysis on, okay, if the grounds, are they being used? If they could be used, how could they be used? How could we use it as a service? Because I know we have different motivations depending on the location and so on. And I'm really not too sure if those conversations, the extent to which those conversations are held. And the other thing I think we need to look at is that, okay, so we're going to have, sport is clearly going to take a hit any kind of sport now within the next year. What are our assumptions and, and so projections in terms of sporting activity generally? Are things going to stay a little bit more online? Um, for example, like how cycling and so on, are we going to move some more of that? Would there be need as much for some of those recreational facilities? So there are other things I think we need to focus on as we look at 2021 20, and beyond. And, and that is why I would ask a, a few more questions because on the face of it, I'm not too sure. I think that there's not there's a misalignment in terms of where we're at and where we may want to spend the funds. And something as simple, I'll just say, for example, chess. Now, I like what Brian was saying in terms of what is the role of the NSO. We have to make sure we have field and national team there internationally, but there are certain things we are supposed to be doing. But I still don't have a home, and chess has been around for years. But you want us to develop, I mean, we've been able to operate as a virtual organization because of the nature of our sport. But understand me that if there are certain basic things that we don't get support from, it speaks to the sustainability of my organization. And, and I am not alone. So, so that's why when I, I, I look at this, I look at you spending this. Okay, so you have all these facilities. Are we trying, as Brian said, are we matching? Could Chess go to Maruga when you're up there at the Maruga facility? Could we have my clubs inside of there go there and use it for the service of Maruga without paying a pound and a crown? Because that is also some of what we face. I have to have a huge rental bill to use a couple a couple of days in, in 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 the facilities in Cuba. So so those are the things that I'm not too sure if we're really looking at some of the practical and can we mention the operational side of it, right? comes it comes to base so, so that's why i looked a little bit you know because I'm, I'm looking at these figures i'm like if we could just make some sort of alignment in terms of what kirvin was saying we need to deliver these are the enabling things that can allow us but that conversation is never held and i've been having a discussion for years so what so what i'm hearing is more entrepreneurs which means more stakeholders coming into the, the, the triangle of sport, 
I'm also hearing more stakeholder analysis or more stakeholder involvement from existing persons in the sporting industry. With that being said, another question coming from that was sent to us by our quick question. Before you go, could I just address the same point you made with regards to the of expenditures? Right. So you see, historically, the ministry has always spent a substantial amount of its allocation on development projects and programs um, because of the number of facilities that we have in Trinidad and Tobago and the Sunda. And based on the ex the expenditures and the for them, it's close to three billion. If you add the current expenditures, it may take it over the three billion mark, not the four million. Uh, yes, and I have the data to prove that. Um, but the thing about it is, when we build those facilities. Somewhere along the line, nobody took into consideration the maintenance cost of those facilities over time. And what we're seeing now is that government then has to spend money to maintain those facilities. What I would like to see, however, is the usage data of those facilities at the end of the day. More so, um, I think it's a very important time right now for the ministry with the responsibility of sport to reconsider the implementation of the sport commission. Uh, Mr. Lewis and myself had the, the, the experience of trying to sit on that committee to steer the way towards the development of the commission. And in doing so, one of the things that we did identify was that the number of facilities in Trinidad and Tobago and the problem it posed with regards to maintenance of those facilities. And it's a hard question, it's a hard thing, but now government may have to look at privatizing those facilities because what they're doing, they're just draining money from the allocations annually. And the utilization or the usage rate, they don't generate enough monies to sustain not even the maintenance cost. So we have some hard questions to answer because we're going to keep spending money and pumping money into the development of those infrastructure, even maintenance, when they are not churning out anything to maintain themselves. So it may be that they have to start looking at privatizing those organizations. One. Uh, two, look towards getting back into the frame of mind of developing the sport commission so that those facilities would then be under the purview of the sport commission. Do you think Mr. that the allocation... Mr. Edwards, I, I don't mean to yes, think, but I really want to... I think Ken Minister was trying to get in just now and I put it... No, no, no. I, I, I definitely... I commented Ken on this question. This, this is a okay, serious no question. You can't do that. This, no, no, no. You see, Kenwin, Kenwin, right now, Kenwin Educational um, Footpath is, is he making some indelible marks in the sun and I'm coming hard with him with this question? Eh? Um, do you think that the allocation of sport reflects the commitment of the government towards the fulfillment of its goals and objectives or the purpose for the establishment of sport? Well, to be quite honest, I think we're in um, an unusual circumstance. Um, if this was last year, the year before, I think that, that that question would have been a bit more pertinent. Um, in this current situation, I think um, from, from the numbers that, that, that is clearly labeled in that um, insert that you had just now, um, the government's viewpoint. So they obviously either know something that, that we on the ground as citizens don't know, or they are thinking just in case. Um, like I alluded before, the integration back into sport and, and how it is going to go for us, I think um, that we do not know yet, that we need to prepare for based on the, the world and also the country's guidelines into back, you know, out from the pandemic. Um, as you can see, the government they, they, they sort of thought that way and they went into allocating monies into the upkeep or maintenance of, of a lot of the, the, the facilities out there. Um, one of the major problems I do think, um, uh, as Mr. Lewis says, the entrepreneurship of stakeholders in, in, in this venture. I think we, we, we need to, to come up with proper plans also, we need to, to, to do some research into the bureaucracy of being able to use these facilities because a lot can happen, I do believe. I know for football, for sure, maybe futsal, um, as we know, cricket is out there. Um, chess, um, I could make one suggestion for chess, not, you know, in the, in the interim, not, not using the, 
the 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 bigger facilities but in in Maruga I'm pretty sure there is a a community center and we we know in Trinidad and Tobago there are a lot of community centers out there I know most of these communities they are run by councils um I think the channel of 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 how we 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 use these facilities need to be looked at. We need to do some investigation, some research into that. And of course, um, as Mr. Lewis said, you know, the entrepreneurs, uh, they need to, to, to start thinking differently. Funny enough, you know, just last night, I had um, a, a conversation with a, a very good friend of mine and we are currently planning to come out ahead um, or be on the front foot for, post-COVID, whenever that is, in terms of firstly starting at home where communities are concerned. Um, of course, we're going to have the to do our due diligence in cooperating with the national um, sporting organizations and how we get sanctioned. Of course, of course, <laughs> how we get sanctioned to be able to do um, something of this sort. Because I do think that we have too many, as you rightfully say, too many community grounds out there um, with lights and, and, and the availability to be used. But no one actually, I think, based on our, our current and past habits of waiting on the government to do something. Um, I think um, there are different levels where the government is concerned and they have participated, Mr. Jean, back in the past. I can remember in the 90s how the government used to run certain programs come the July August vacations in getting people involved in sport. They used to, for some reason, whether it be crime, whether it be a different political view, um, I think they, they, they've come away from that a little bit. But they, a lot, a lot can still fall on the shoulder of the of the ordinary citizen to 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 pick up where they they seem to have left off or or negated from. Um, it would take us to actually, like I say, build locally first before we think internationally. Because um, in this current climate, we cannot see where we are going to to be involved in international competition based on the allocation from the budget. So we have to start thinking to build within first before we go outside. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have our last segment, which is the closing remarks from all guests. I do not want anybody's um, companion calling me to say that I took them over time. Um, that is not, you know, I, I, I as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a lover, I, I also understand the purpose of spending this beautiful Sunday evening with loved ones. Um, but we'll be right back. And as we take this break, we want to, as we talk about pivoting, the Futsal 868 online certified course is on. We had our first session yesterday. Brilliant. We continue. Feel free to contact us via our WhatsApp hotline. That's 78 Sport, 787 7678. We'll be right back. You're watching Futsal 868 Corner Talks. Hello, coaches. Good afternoon. I'm Sergio Gargelli, Futsal Solution Instructor. I will be one of your instructors in the next Futsal 868 course. I'm ready to start. See you soon next weekend. It was very interesting because every time the, the team tries to put this 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 a show together, we always we, we went from saying saying, well, I don't know, I don't know if it's if we can make up the time to being always not enough. But to my entire panel, Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Shah, Mr. Jones, I want to say thank you very much for gracing us with your presence once again. And I would like you all to 
leave us with your closing remarks as regards to, and this segment we're asking for recommendations. It's one thing for us to understand who is not doing what. We have dealt with the, the what, the how, the why. Now for us, so let's introduce suggestions, solutions, recommendations. Mr. Johnson. First of all, thank you and thank you to the, the, my fellow members on, on the panel. Thanks for having me here. Um, my kind of theme for 2020 so far has just been very simple. We need to level up. Yeah. Um, so my advice really is to really focus a lot of the resources and efforts on leveling up in terms of capacity building, um, building additional resources, your competence, um, getting your, your governance in, in place and so on, because this is because post COVID, all this time into post COVID, it's going to be a completely new environment and we need to be prepared. So that is what I want to leave with today. Let's level up. Let's level up. Mr. Lewis. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, one, feel free to contact the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. We are running a number of virtual courses and various things including our entrepreneurship expect that. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, I encourage uh, Kenwin, so I'm giving, a, I encourage Kenwin to pursue um, what, what he intends to, to do, go hard. Um, and I would also advise, and I'm saying this sincerely, any national sporting organization out there to contact the Footstyle um, organization, because obviously, they are doing something right. They're obviously not sitting and crying. Um, I was watching some of the ads, etc., and I think that's important. And to me, that's where really the collaboration and reach out should be. If you see somebody, an organization doing something that makes sense, like Footstar, like the TTOC, um, Kenwin Jones, that's where Coven, I mean, has a lot of good advice. Um, I think that's what needs to happen. That's what we need to do in the short term because. COVID-19 is real. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Mr. Lewis, I just want to piggyback on that because my words that was expressed on Power 102 in terms of the pre-budget was words echoed by yourself and Mr. Ja. It's lessons learned in here and you all speak in public. And I can come in public and say that I am learning. And it's, that's what it's about. It's about being a transitional leader in order for us to understand that we have to learn in order to take our organizations and not just our organizations, but coming from a spiritual background in order to ensure that our part of the vineyard that we are toiling in produces beautiful flowers. And that is very important to myself in terms of continuing legacy that my father, who's sitting right next to me here, listening, that his legacy continues in every way possible. So on to you, Mr. Jean. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I think I just reiterate what I've been saying over over again to NGBs in terms of moving forward. Um, we know we are operating in strenuous times. Um, we have cut budgets. In most instances, some of our operations will not be moving forward. We know that. I think it, as opposed to looking at it as a loss, is to look at the benefits in it. Uh, someone once said, never waste a good pandemic, and I think we are in the opportune moment right now to take advantage of it. The reason being, in most instances, when you look at sport, the operational side and the administrative sport tend to be at heads in most instances with the operational side taking precedence and winning. Now is an opportunity to sit down and reorganize your administrations. In other words, you have this time to put your house in order. Ensure that you have alignment, your strategic plan is aligned to the national policy and sport, as well as the international policies or mandates of your organization. Understanding that there is a tripartite in terms of the international, regional, and national policies that affect your operation. So now is a proper time to have that alignment so that you actually know the way forward. If something is not working, some organizations have not even looked at their constitutions in a while. Fix your constitutions, look at your strategic plans. Are they still relevant? And I think that is the opportune time to look inward and do some house cleaning. Subsequent to that, you need to start thinking out of the box. It cannot be that you put everything on hold because what? Because you can't have proper the operational side of, work, of sport. You need to start thinking outside of the box in terms of how you're going to continue with your operations, whether it be virtual or some other medium. 
Again, I would not, I'll stress again, you need to be in contact with your membership as well as your athletes. It, you cannot sideline your athletes simply because you're going through this situation right now. Everybody's in this together. Reach out to your athletes. Ensure that you make arrangements of your athletes, whether it be online engagement, virtual engagement, that has to happen. Now is an opportune time. If you're not skilled, if you're not qualified, there are a number of short courses out there. The University of the West Indies Faculty of Sport, as well as the Open Campus Academy of Sport, which I had, offer a number of sport-specific courses to NGBs. Additionally, the UE OCAS works with national governing bodies to render assistance. Uh, Mr. Lewis, I'm pretty sure you have in front of you right now a skeletal proposal um, with regards to the OCAS approach in Canoc to work with them to deliver specialty courses in this specific time that are targeting national governing bodies and sport serving bodies across the region. Because I do think that we need to have this alignment if we are truly serious about developing the sport industry, not only in Trinidad, but the rest of the region. So I think everyone now has to have a right opportunity to sit down and basically do some house cleaning. Plan, strategize, and look past the current situation is how you're going to approach the future. And that is the, recommend, that is the recommendations that I have to speak on this right now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Job. Kevin, before you go, um, I, I, it's interesting that my panelists, I, I have to show this because even without him playing football, he still have cheerleaders on his side. So, <laughs> Carissa Boyan says, well done, Ken, when you represented the UE FIFA Postgrad Diploma Class 2021 well with your contributions. <laughs> well, exactly what Mr. Jean said, you know, um, in, the, in this time, I, I think we as human beings are made to evolve. Um, if we're sitting still in this pandemic and not thinking forward, or even before the pandemic, if, we, if, if we're strategic plans are not three to five years in advance, or even now, or at the beginning of the pandemic, we haven't sat down as an organization um, to, to, to restructure, to see how best you can, can, can you know, alter your strategic plan to, to work within the, the pandemic and then outside of it, I think we have a problem. Um, I have to give kudos to, to the Futsal Association of Trinidad and Tobago, Futsal 868 for, for the innovative and creative technological ways they, they have gone about. Um, keeping in contact and getting information out there. Obviously the TTOC, you all are leading by example. I think a lot of other organizations can, 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 can look to you. And as you rightfully said, Mr. Lewis, call the TTOC. Uh, there's always someone you can speak to. You can call the Futsal Association, I'm pretty sure, to get information. But we have to start thinking differently. For far too long, I think we have been dependent. It has made us disabled somewhat, but now is the time for us to, to, to regenerate, to, to restructure, to reorganize, and to come out of this pandemic, and during the pandemic, better organizations and better people. Well said, well said, Kenwin. And on that, um, on that, well, Kenwin, <laughs> but, but, but that in the background, yes, can give your head regards as you're here, you know? Thank you, Mr. Edwards. <laughs> so, so that's my, um, that's my co-host, my father, who I love dearly and who has me where I am as a, as in terms of sport. And a uh, quick fact, you know, he also taught Kenwin's dad as well, so. Quick fact, but as we close the show, it's very important to recognize that three of the four guests has been with us in the past when it comes to when we speak to racial inequality and social justice in sport. And even though we are speaking to the national budget, as Kenwin said, we have to come together. Mr. Jha said it, and everyone has said we have to come together to unite. And we as an association, we are not going to take our foot off of racial inequality. So we want to be able to say, before we leave, we want to be able to address this in our way. It is our responsibility to commit to making a positive difference in our society. Listen, read, be a standing voice against discrimination and injustices. I am Irene Marquez. I am Dee. I am Ikenna. I am Jaria McCullen. And racism ends with me.
and it really does end with me. And everyone you see there are part of the Futsal 868 movement. And I want to say thanks, special thanks to Irini Marquez, who spearheaded that campaign and who continues to spearhead that campaign because Mr. Lewis, Mr. Jones, and Mrs. Johnson, who were guests here before, have really put a fire in us to not just speak about it when it's time, but to continuously speak about it. And this is what we'll continue to do, as well as help the landscape of, of, of sport in Trinidad and Tobago. As you see what we are doing here, we are bringing sport to you. I'm going to say thank you very much for looking at us once again. Another beautiful Sunday evening. And yes, feel free to contact us because we, we want to share. We want to give back. We want to continue to grow and develop. That's all we can do in this time. We have to bring back community and family once again. So it's my pleasure to, on behalf of the Futsal 868 family, to say thank you very much for joining us. It has been our pleasure. See you next week. Thank you.